All right, Mijuxus everyone. Uh, welcome to First Foods. My name is Desiree Kane. I'm a Miwok to Spirit living in occupied Arapaho territory in Colorado. Uh, we just want to say thank you to our sponsor Ibex Puppetry and the community that comes with for the support in making the First Foods program happen. Hi, so welcome everybody. My name is Brooke Rodriguez. I am the program manager and uh, along with Desiree, we work on First Foods. I'm a Taino mother living on Matinecock territory in New York. And I just want to thank everybody for coming back and just thanking for thanking our teachers for coming as well to this panel discussion and just going to go over a few items with everybody going to run them by really fast because I know we've covered them pretty um, much in every single class but so just some protocols and disclaimers. So the first one is land acknowledgement. We recognize, uphold, and respect Native nations and their lifeways above all else as the ruling governance of Turtle Island in Abiala. And we want everyone that's coming to this space to respect uh, that. And that's just one of the requirements for being here. Native knowledge, everything that's shared in this panel is, is the same as everything that's shared in the class. This is not to monetize or to repackage as your own or to misappropriate or appropriate as a non-native or even as a nation, as a different nation from a different um, territory. So foraging and harvest, always seek permission um, with whatever advice or guidance that's given, always seek permission from tribal communities to forage and harvest. You always want to make sure that you're upholding um, land acknowledgement to its fullest extent. And um, just backtracking on land, uh, land acknowledgement for natives, of course, we follow protocol and we always ask permission and we acknowledge whose territories we're on so that we do not violate sovereignty. And for non-natives, it is more than formalities. It has to be actions and has to be shown. Uh, so just one way to do that is through harvesting and foraging that you're asking for permission to harvest these medicines and foods um, they might be seasonal, they may not be seasonal, they be, be need to replenish at that time, as well as um, you never know if they're being used for ceremonial reasons or you need to have ceremony or certain medicines persons gather them. Not everybody is meant to be a gatherer or a forager or a medicine keeper and therefore you have to respect those traditions and always respect if there's a no, right, because we want to be following consent. Uh, as well. This is also an intertribal space. So remember that we are all from different nations and regions. So what we what may be odd to one nation or disrespectful or religious or sacred to one nation may not be the same. And we just have to understand that these foods and medicines are on vast territories and they may, you know, it may not be the same protocols for each nation. So always go back to your elders, to your medicine keepers. And remember that these food systems are shared uh, between borders, as well as they might have different names. So we don't want a, a situation where, you know, one nation is saying, oh, this is the proper way over another when it just might be same plant, but different nations that are, have been using it for a millennia. Um, also no, do not claim to have uh, exclusivity or copyrights of your, for your own people. Cause like we explained before, there might be multiple regions that the plant uh, resides in and it is working with and um, building relations with different nations. It's okay to share the name of plants or medicines that you have, uh, as long as it's done with proper protocol for your community. Uh, no descent over blood quantum, please. This is an intertribal space. Everybody has a different connection with colonization, a different um, understanding of, of blood quantum, but we don't want uh, in this space any arguments about blood quantum or who's more Indian -er than the next person or anything like that. This is an intertribal space. So just please respect that. And please respect traditional, again, going back to land acknowledgement and proper protocols, formalities, please respect traditional borders and boundaries amongst one another. And lastly, food sovereignty. Uh, first people have the rights to hunt, fish, forage, harvest in their traditional territories. It is unacceptable, unacceptable to critique traditional or contempor contemporary dietary uh, styles as a non-native. That's just that's an internal dialogue between community members. It's not for non-natives or settlers to comment on. 
And lastly, our disclaimer, just a friendly reminder, First Foods is for educational purposes only before using or ingesting any herb or plant for medicinal or culinary purposes, please consult a physician, medical herbalist, or a suitable professional, or, you know, if you're from a traditional community, your elders. And just one last minute reminder, at the end, we will have giveaways. So please stay tuned for that. We have free giveaways to give for this panel and we'll be moving forward announcing giveaways at the end of each panel for the month. And that's the last of the basically household items that we had to discuss. All right. So welcome to the First Foods panel discussion, the very first one. A, this, um, this panel discussion is part of a program called First Foods, which is led by and made for Indigenous people and our allies who are ready for a new day for old ways. Uh, we'd like to thank our partner, Ibex Puppetry, for the ongoing support as we build this program that makes critical culture available from the culture bearers that hold the oldest knowledge on the continent, which is something so many of us need at this time. Mm -hmm. So today I have the honor of introducing uh, Kristenia Iala. Um, she is teaching our panel, which features uh, the instructors that you've seen for the last three weeks, Linda Black Elk, Isaac Murdoch, and Emma E. Elliott. And the topic is our relationship with the land. Um, so her biography. Kristenia Iala is co-director of Tiosh Bae Wiyamaka, which in Lakota means extended family of women of the earth, which can be found on the web at tioshbaewiyamaka.org, which I will share in the chat here in just a little bit. Kristenia is founder and executive director. Um, it is a Colorado nonprofit that she's been running for more than 15 years in support of the mission of advocating for promoting and supporting alternative housing and energy, nutritional and educational sovereignty. Uh, in 2004, Iala earned a Bachelor's of Science in Psychology from Regis University and went on for an additional year of study in nonprofit management. She served on the Colorado Coalition for the Homeless with Director John Parvensky, uh, the Commission on the Status of Women, and the Community Advisory Board of Larimer County. Yala respectfully declined directorship of the Center for Justice, Peace, and Environment to pursue, pursue her calling to serve the Native populations in Denver, Fort Collins, and Pine Ridge and Rosebud Reservations in South Dakota. Over the next 25 years, she became immersed in the traditions, values, and life ways of her mother's people, the Sichangu Lakota of the Rosebud Reservation, extending her commitment to the global community of indigenous people. So welcome, Kristenia. Thank you for coming and, and we'll leave it to you. Well, okay, thank you, Desiree. Um, I'm a little nervous. Uh, so bear with me. I'll tell you a little bit about me. My name is Kristenia Ayala. I'm a 73-year-old elder of the Sichangu Band of the Lakota Nation uh, on my mother's side, and I'm Ilocano Filipina on my father's side. His village is San Esteban in the northern mountains area of northern Luzon. I currently live in a, a Arapaho and Northern Cheyenne territory that uh, that we sh that has been shared with the Lakota. Um, oh, that's what I said. Having shared <laughs> for sharing with the Lakota for several centuries now. Um, so first, I would like to introduce um, our first guest speaker. Um, instructor Linda Black Elk is an ethnobotanist who specializes in teaching about plants of cultural importance and their uses such as food, medicines, and materials. Linda works to develop a curriculum and ways of thinking that promote and protect food sovereignty, traditional plant knowledge, and environmental quality as an extension of the fight against hydraulic fracturing and the fossil fuel industry. And she's also my niece. 
and I love her. Linda. Hi, everybody. Hi, Auntie. Um, thanks so much Hi. for the intro. Um, I'm really honored to be here. And um, I'm sorry to say that uh, I'm, I'm not in a place where things are quiet and calm and things like that. Uh, we've been foraging today. Um, we're on like a quite a foraging expedition, actually. And as you guys can see behind, oh, my, my little one's in his um, chair and then Okay. <laughs> yeah there's oh that's your auntie on there huh? <laughs> so, um but uh yeah thanks for having me and like my auntie christine said i'm an ethnobotanist and um uh, a lot of my friends are on this webinar and and people that i know and um i'm just honored to be here so thanks so basically um what we've been doing um so okay you know, I, I, I was telling you guys before the participants got on, um, the, the plants don't wait for us. Um, we have to be ready whenever they're ready. And so sometimes that means that, you know, if you have um, an event like this going on, um, a webinar, or, you know, or if you have to work even, um, it's really hard to, you know, I, I think, that, that's something really important to point out is that foraging, being able to forage, being able to go out, be, having the time to make your own medicine and to, um, you know, uh, put all your foods together, maybe to even ferment foods. That's really a privilege. And I feel very privileged to have the time to do that um, because it, it takes a lot of time and effort. Um, and if, if, you know, if I were considered an essential employee, um, you know, like if I worked in the medical field or in a grocery store, I probably wouldn't have the time to be doing all of this foraging right now. Um, but I, I do want to say that when we're out foraging, so for instance, yesterday we were in Minneapolis and um, there was some gorgeous motherwort growing. And this is motherwort. Oh, by the way, you guys, I, I don't know if it's found or not. Oh, I think I can. So um, <laughs> that's motherwort sitting on the dashboard of my car, okay? And the reason it's there is because the dashboard of your car is the best place to dry plants, okay? I'm telling you, there's nowhere where plants will dry faster and more thoroughly. Sometimes they'll even dry faster on the dashboard than they will in a dehydrator. So just a pro tip there <laughs> for you guys. But yep, so yesterday we got some motherwort gorgeous, huge motherwort growing all over. And, um, you know, it's, it's when I saw it, you know, I, um, I knew that it was something that I was going to harvest right now because everyone's having such a hard time. Um, and motherwort is great for anxiety and feelings of depression. Um, but it's also wonderful for women, um, who might be having some post, um, uh, after they have a baby, um, you know, maybe feelings of depression and things like that, um, or anxiety, but, but really like I use it for, for everyone, men and women at all stages, but it's such a fantastic plant. Um, motherwort Leonardus, Leonardus cardiaca, if anybody needs the scientific names. Um, we've also been, um, so, so that was one plant. We've also been gathering, um, something that I was really happy to find yesterday, um, is wild asparagus is ready right now and forgive me but I already ate the tip off of this one <laughs> a couple hours ago oh we have we have lots more um lots more asparagus and we're gonna actually go out and get more I'm um, sorry I munch on it anytime there's any wild stuff growing it's kind of like one for me and one for the basket and one for me and one for the basket when it's berries, it's two for me and one for the basket. But, um, but the thing is, is when we gather these plants, it's, it's not just for us and our family, it's for our community or anyone who asks. Um, we, uh, you know, so, so we have to gather quite a bit um, because it's hard for elders to get out there, but it's also really hard. Like I have a lot of friends who live in areas where these plants grow, but they don't know what they look like. And so um, I really, 
encourage people to like, you know, find out what these plants look like, how to identify them accurately um, so that you can get out there and harvest them for your family and um, your community too. We were also harvesting and Isaac, I'm sure you probably get a lot of this too. Um, this is sarsaparilla, wild sarsaparilla root. And um, if you scratch it a little bit, mm, it has a gorgeous, like really mild root beer kind of smell. And um, we'll be making like a, a simple syrup out of that. Um, and uh, we'll use that for tea as well. It really makes a lot of the more bitter teas go down easier. So um, wild sarsaparilla, motherwort, asparagus. Um, we were still finding um, bracken ferns that were that are still ready. Um, a lot of the bracken ferns are too far along. Um, how many of you guys eat fiddleheads? Uh, do you eat fiddlehead ferns in the in the spring? We collect two types of fiddlehead ferns. These bracken ferns, which are really um, a delicacy all over. Sorry about my dirty foraging fingernails, y'all. <laughs> embarrassing um been a tough day <laughs> um but these bracken ferns are a delicacy in many places in the world I know my Ojibwe friends absolutely love them in soups with um wild onions uh a lot of I'm, I'm part Asian a lot of you guys know that and um a lot of my Asian family loves bracken ferns as well but these these have to be cooked you have to cook bracken ferns. Um, they contain kind of a mild carcinogen, um, which, you know, that when I say that, that scares people away and they're like, oh, never mind, I'm not going to eat that. Um, but with, with any cooking, that carcinogen goes away. So um, it's, it's very safe and it's very nutritious. Not only that, if I were to tell you about all the foods that you eat that are carcinogenic or mildly carcinogenic, you'd be very shocked. Um, this is probably one of the, you know, a much, much less of a threat than some of the other things. Um, I, I always find it very interesting when you tell a smoker that, that something is mildly carcinogenic, but it's rendered completely safe when it's cooked and they still won't eat it, even though they still smoke cigarettes. Anyway, <laughs> so um, we've been getting some of those. Um, and um, yeah, I, I mean, you know, lots of other stuff. Um, we'll, we'll be collecting more things. Of course, right now we're looking for mushrooms. We got some beautiful dryads saddle mushroom yesterday, very nutritious. Um, a lot of the fungi and the mushrooms are amazing, um, for opioid addiction. So, um, when I come across someone who needs help, um, with, in, with recovery, um, I always put together and recommend mushroom capsules and very often dryad saddle is one of the ingredients in there. I also love lion's mane, um, shiitake, reishi, uh, you know, all dried, powdered and put into a capsule. It really helps with um, the, 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 um, the difficulties of getting off of um, opiates. So, um, so yeah, so we've been collecting a lot of those and, and just, you know, bunches of other stuff, trying to do it in a good way, um, you know, making sure to offer our tobacco and, um, you know, making sure to sing our songs and say our prayers and, um, you know, trying to always acknowledge the people who live here now, but the people who have lived here before. Um, just in the past couple of days, we've, couple of days, we've been on traditional Dakota um, and Ojibwe um, lands. Um, oh, and probably some Potawatomi too, actually. So, you know, we're, we, you know, send love to our brothers and sisters and always make sure that we ask permission and that they know we're there and um, that we have permission to pick those plants. And, um, and you know, we, of course we practice reciprocity uh, as well. So anyway, yeah, I guess I, I, want, I want to hear everyone else talk. So um, <laughs> that's all I'll say for now, but I'm happy to answer questions and stuff too. Uh, Linda, if I could, I would love to comment on, uh, I, I watched your, the first uh, panel that you were on, and I loved it when you talked about Western medicine, uh, because 
Uh, I learned something through a healing ceremony when I was diagnosed with uh, multiple sclerosis about 20 years ago. And um, I, got, I got the diagnosis from a neurologist. And um, I felt very frightened, but I don't like Western medicine. And I went to a friend who said, that, oh, you got to sponsor a healing ceremony. And so we put it together and they said, he said, well, we've got to do four, four ceremonies. And they said, okay, is it once a week, once a month? <laughs> and he said, no, it will be four nights in a row. So we had that four nights in a row. And on the third night, Spirit came to me, and I knew that I had been healed, and it was, and I loved it because then the uh, the medicine man said, "Okay, it's over. Turn on the lights." And they said, "They said, oh, everybody was stretching. Oh, good, just one more night." And he said, "No, no, not one more. It's it's finished. She was healed tonight." So then, um, then he called me to the to him. And he said, Kristen, it was, this was a good thing that you did. He said, because you, and this is sometimes where Western medicine can blend well with traditional uh, medicine. And he said, but let me tell you something. He said, words are very powerful. Now we all know that we've all been taught that be careful how you speak, be careful of your tone of voice, that kind of thing. Uh, he said, words are very powerful. And when that doctor told you, that you have multiple sclerosis, what he did was he planted that word seed in your head. And when you plant a word seed in your head and you, and you, let, it, you let it stay there and you dwell on it, it starts to grow roots and those roots can go down into your body and they manifest all the symptoms of whatever disease somebody has told you that you have. He said, when, you, when I told you you were healed tonight, spirit came to you. And they took that seed right out of your, your head, roots and all. So you're healed and you don't have to think about it anymore. So don't think about it. Don't worry about it because you are fully healed. And, but when you go to ceremony, any ceremony you go to, you always pray for continued healing. So when I heard you speaking about Western doctors and how they think, oh, an illness is something that's just up here, you know, not realizing that it manifests itself spiritually, emotionally, phys physically. I loved it. it. It just was so meaningful to me. Thank you very much for that. I just wanted to mention that to you. I love you. Thank you so much. I love okay. you too. And I'm so, I'm so happy to hear that because I, I, I think that Western medicine and, um, you know, even a lot of my friends and, and people who work um, in, in, a, in a lot of fields, uh, you can actually read a lot of information about manifesting and about um, how our mental, emotional, and spiritual self, um, you know, can, can be not just the cause, but the cure for a lot of illness. Um, mm -hmm. And so I, I really love, love hearing that and, and love your story because um, I, I just think it's so important. And, and, you know, the, now the, the, the funny thing is, well, not funny, but the interesting thing is that Western science is starting to kind of catch up to it a little, right? Because they're finally mm -hmm. starting to acknowledge that depression is linked to inflammatory diseases like arthritis, you know? Um, and I mean, it's, it's, uh, it seems so obvious to uh, indigenous people, but, uh, you know, it hasn't been acknowledged by Western science for so long and they, they're finally starting to see it. So. Thank you so much. Uh -huh. Oh, that was wonderful. I really enjoyed that. And I enjoyed today too. Um, so let's move on then, because I know you're excited to hear everybody else speak, Ninda. That's what you said. Well, now I have to, I have to go see who, okay. Ah, well, this shouldn't take long. Okay, our next um, speaker will be um, Isaac Murdoch. And he is a, um, a, a, a traditional, uh, oh, where's my notes? <laughs> He's a wonderful human being who tells wonderful stories. Oh, my gosh. I listened to your stories, and I was just amazed. And you know how much I love, I love indigeneity 
one of my favorite stories to talk about is that, like you said, Isaac, at one time we were all indigenous people and we're all responsible for the shape that the world is in today. And so we all have to come back together to make things right with the earth, to ask her forgiveness and to, you know, and to humble ourselves uh, to get back in balance. And so I really enjoyed that. I also enjoyed the fact that it confirmed for me that all of the indigenous people share so many common uh, medicinal plants and uh, uh, nurturing plants. Uh, but then we all also have, because of the regions that we come from, we all also have uh, medicinal plants that are very unique to our people. Um, and so, uh, um, Isaac is from Serpent River First Nation and is a fish clan Ojibwe. He's known for storytelling and land-based activities. Spending many years on the land with his elders is his primary education, which he loves to share. He has three beautiful children, Elaine, Preston, and Waabigwan. So, um, Isaac? I'm anxious to, to hear what you have to offer us today. Thank you very much. Ani bonjour. Mandan ap kine ge go na be indigenous kaz fam gizik. Kine be go kshi be kaz wat and don't ba gna ba ching. Gnoji and do dem. Ndo nishna be ndao. So my name is Isaac. I'm from Serpent River First Nation. I am Ojibwe and I'm really happy to be here uh, amongst such amazing people. You know, as a child, I remember living on the land and we used to paddle from lake to lake, uh, up rivers into muskegs. And we used to just, just live on the land and we never had a garbage can. We didn't even know what a garbage can was. And it was a very beautiful life. But one of the things I noticed that as we weaved in and out of this, this beautiful green blanket of life on the land, is that offerings was always so important. And so Linda talked about that, about the offerings. And so that's something I want to, to share a little bit about. You know, our people, we believe that little people live in the rocks and in the tree stumps and along the river's edges. And there's different types of little people. There's the Mimigwesiwak, who are a very magical being. They're small little hairy, people that live inside the rocks. There's the Pahisak. You know, they're very gifted with arrows. And of course, there's the Pagujininiwak, which are like little children that live, live in the forest. There's Pagawagamik, which is like a half beaver and half human. And then of course we have Thunderbirds, you know, the Maneshiwak. And we have Ginebeguk, the, the serpents. And the Banabe Kweak, the mermaids. And there's all these spirit uh, beings that live in the forest, like Pagak, Tobiabus, you know, Pakwas. And so growing up on the land, the elders would always say, oh, you know, so-and-so lives over there. You know, the Mimigwesiwak lived there, the little people. And that place is called Dashkapgak. They would say, you know, our people go there during times of sickness, famine, and disease, and warfare. And those little people, they can help us. And we, we go there and we fast and we pray so that we can get knowledge from them. And when we're done, we, we paint on those rocks with ornament. Muslim Abiyaganan, you know, we paint those pictures on there. And so I was fascinated by this concept of always giving. And our people, wherever we traveled, they'd say, oh, the Thunderbirds live there, we'd give offerings. Oh, Bagok lives over there, we'd give offerings every single time. There wasn't one time we'd go by without leaving something. And so as we took from the earth, you know, whatever it was, you know, we'd always give something back because we believe that we come from the stars and that we're just visitors here. And that as we make our way to earth, we go through four sacred powers. 
We go through the power of fire. We go through the power of, of wind. And then through the power of, of earth and water. And when we get here, we're just guests living in this beautiful land of spirits that I talked about. And that as guests, we have to make our offerings and be good, be good visitors, you know, and, and make sure that we live according to the natural laws that are here. Object we bescaw being um, Nikia. You know, we always make sure that our, our offerings are, are given constantly. Because when you look at a diverse uh, ecosystem or forest or, or prairie, you'll notice how everything contributes to everything else and everything gives everything to everything. And so as an Ishnabek, that's our practice. We have to give our stuff away, just like what Linda was saying. You know, this stuff is not just for me. This is for the old people. This is for my people. We have to give these things away. And that's a natural law. And when we do that, when we give everything to everything, that's, that means that we're, we're, we're following um, the sacred road that we're supposed to follow here on the earth. And so growing up, you know, that's, that's how we lived. We never had much. We always had very little because we always gave everything away. But people always gave us stuff and we were rich. You know, they talked about this elaborate tunnel system underneath the ground. They'd say, oh, and a serpent lives at Chigenebuk uh, Gaming. And there's a tunnel that goes underneath the ground. It comes up at Kipkop Kipnik Singh. And then it goes down again. And this tunnel comes up at Mendigweyasin. And then it comes up again at Genebeguk Shibigajwat. Then it comes up at Genebeguk Niashing. And then it goes to Shkodeyeng. And then it goes to Bodashkayeng. Then it goes to Kwekwekajong. And so they always talked about this tunnel system where these, these water beings and these serpents and these lizards and these creatures lived. And then they'd say the tunnel goes to a Siniswasaning. And then it goes to Nadwe Gojing and then Ab Abdak Kisning. So as a child, they, they were telling me this map of this underworld. Each one of those places is where we fasted. Because we knew that, the, that these spirit beings, were, they lived there in caves. And so that's when we would ask, you know, for food. So we'd, we'd fast and we'd pray there. And prayer was really important because if you can get those, those spirits in the underground to favor you, then those plants, they'll migrate to where you are. The, uh, the ground is very powerful. And those plants, they, they'll find you. They'll migrate to where you are because of those petitions and those prayers that you made to the earth and all the spirits inside of it. And so there is a delicate balance. Nothing came without sacrifice and nothing came without, without giving. And sometimes it was giving our own selves. You know, the old people would say a long time ago, it was nothing for somebody to give their life for somebody else so that they could have food to eat, so that they could have something. You know, Anishinaabe Abdek Webeska being Nikia, Ndapna nan, you know, kadakim nan. Nishna bek kina gita men. Kapska be dapna nan anyway, minwa enjbayen. They always said we have to go back to the sustainable way of how we live. That we have to go back to the those old laws. You know, and that's something that. Um, Western education has not been really been able to figure out is how to produce a sustainable land-based economy. And so traditional knowledge is, uh, is very, very important. And just like the, uh, present, the last speakers were saying, is that, that science and Western education is just starting to catch up to traditional knowledge. And so having a, a land-based education is critical 
um, for, for us to survive here on earth. And, you know, and what it requires is hard work. It requires sacrifice and change, but also to understand something that very, very few people do. And that's up there, the stars. The whole map of our food is up there. They call that, uh, you know, when you look at those different pictures that are hanging up there, those are sacred sites. We consider like, for example, um, Nagajig, you know, the Orion's belt. We consider that a sacred site. And that's uh, the rabbit, the rabbit poop in its guts for one of our spirits that live up there. It's a funny story. I'll have to tell you some other time. But when we pray to those things and we give offerings to those, they can help us here on earth find what we need. There's such a strong connection between the earth, the sky, and beyond. And somehow we're stuck in the middle. And so being able to, to have a, a, an education where we can learn from the sky, we'll, we'll learn how to live here too. You know, I think that um, right now we're in a very special time where we don't know what to do. A lot of people are stuck because they live, they live in a world where they have to pay their bills. They have to go to the work. They have to pay their mortgages. They have to do all of this stuff. And it's very, very hard to get out of. And a lot of people wonder, well, what am I supposed to do? I can't just go, go run around and, and do everything. So there's a lot of soul searching. Because right now we're in a massive ecological collapse and we're, in, and we're in a climate crisis and the world needs people to change. And that's gonna take sacrifice. But just like I said, we have all those places. You know, the land is full of sacred. Everywhere you go, you'll find sacred. You know, go there, ask them for your, your help, make your petitions. And you'll be guided into the right way. Uh, before I go, I want to talk about one thing. This. This is dry meat. You know, it's, it smells delicious. It's moose. And I, I wanted to give a little teaching about it. The old people said, you know, the moose, it eats in the swamps. It goes to the hard, hard to reach places in the swamps where we don't go. And that, that moose, it stores all of that, that medicine in its fat, in its body, in its meat. And that the moose comes from the earth. And that our ancestors are also a part of that moose. So when we eat that dry meat, when we smoke it, it be, there's medicine inside there. So the medicine gets transferred from the land to the moose, then to us. And when we smoke that meat, that we us, that smoke, it does a lot of things. It's antibacterial. It, 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 can, it, it cleans you and it protects you. And so when we eat that dry meat, we know that our ancestors are in there somewhere too. And it makes us strong. You know, they used to say that the knowledge of things are stored in the fat of animals. You know, like a, like a gigo, like a fish. A fish will stare at the stars for a long time. And they, they stare at this bagunogizic, a hole in the sky. And when they stare at that, they can see the future. And they store that knowledge in its fat. So when we eat that fish, that fat becomes a part of our fat. That, their knowledge becomes a part of our knowledge. Same with trees, jingwak. Jingwak nang. When you look up and you see the, the stars, that you'll see that white pine, that giant white pine always reaching up to them. And so when we drink that, that medicine, we're also drinking knowledge. And that knowledge, 
you know, food is knowledge for us. It's very, it's medicine, it's sacred. And so, you know, for, for many indigenous people, um, the relationship between the food, the medicines and the spirit world, it's all the same thing. And so that's why we always make offerings, you know, begin to get when, you know, I'm always going to offer my tobacco or my, my presence to the land for the knowledge that we get. And so when people say that this knowledge is inherent, that's what they're talking about sometimes because we inherently get knowledge from the land and the food that we eat. And, you know, I, I always, um, I, I, I don't know the English names of any of the plants, so I can't really talk about the, them, but I will talk about one plant. And this plant is a very, very special plant. And, you know, years ago, I was very sick. And I was dying. I was dying. I was, I was only about five years old or six years old. And this, this medicine man, he went to this, they had a jiska and a shaking tent ceremony to find out how to cure this little Indian boy who was me. And the, the spirits told him, you have to go to the rocks and the little people will be waiting for you there and they'll tell you what, what's going to happen. And so the, the medicine man went to those rocks and they call him uh, Tignogonic. And then is what the name of those rocks are. And he went there. And all of a sudden, this place called Dashkapkak, the rock opened up for him. And a little person came out and told him, for many years, this plant has been watching that boy and has been following him. And because the plants know the future, they knew he was going to get sick. And they followed him. And so all the medicine that he needs, it's all around their lodge. Go there and pick that medicine. And that, that medicine was Ginebuk uh, Buk, is what it's called. So right away he came back and he made a bunch of that that Ginebuk Buk. And they boiled it. And they, they made a big pot of it. And they, they put it in water. And they put me in there. And they grabbed those leaves and they put them all over my body, just like what that lady was saying. They put those leaves all over me. You know what? Those leaves, they start to swell up. They start to take that out. They call that gubsen. They start to take things out of me. And I was cured. And those leaves are also good to eat. So those plants... Because they, they too look at the stars. They know everything. And they talk to each other. They're, they're like this. They're nations. So when we mix our medicines, when we have medicines, we adopt them to be a part of our families. We welcome them into our family. And they become a part of our family when we carry those medicines. And we re respect them like that. Um, there's other people that need to talk, so I'm going to shut her down. Um, but thank you for, for having me. And uh, I just wanted to talk about the offerings and the spirit of things um, through, through my experiences as an Anishinaabe living in the bush. So, Chime Gwich, Wagom, Bama Pigwa, Min Min Mwa, Naha. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Isaac. That was wonderful. And um, I wanted to, to comment because I, I listened to your your um, your um, talk from last week, I guess it was. And I'll tell you the thing that touched me the most, of course, was when you said um, that uh, Earth is Earth is the most competent healthcare system in the world, and that our ceremonies um, are part of our indigenous health system, the most important, you know? And um, so 
I, and I love that uh, as the Red Road Woman, uh, but I also I also love that um, uh, we can't let to stay in balance. We chose any. We can't let anything get out of balance. You know, we have to stay strong in all four aspects of our human self. And um, I remember the one thing that they that they used to emphasize too at Sundance is. Um, don't let yourself get, get out of balance spiritually, you know, and, uh, and and that made sense to me because I think about so many fundamentalists who who did that, you know, they're really out of balance in that way sometimes. So I really want to thank you because I, I you know, I'm such a eye opener for me. As long as, as as well as the fact that for me, you made such a beautiful uh, picture of true matakaye oyasin, how you know we're all related and how when we partake of take different plants into our bodies and different of a rel our relatives, our fur legged, our the winged ones and like that, you know, the uh, standing silent ones, um, that we become a part of a part of all of that. You know. So I really want to thank you. That was very meaningful. Thank you for that. Miigwech. Mm-hmm. Well, does anybody have any questions right now? Or, or can we take them if, if anybody has a question for Isaac? Okay, well then we will move on to Emma. It's, okay, um, Emma E. Elliott, uh, her lineage comes from the Kiowa, Olita, Baruka, and Bribri tribes. She's a cultural activist artist and and um and school design coach residing in california she was raised in traditional plants and cultural knowledge and given the privilege to work with elders from across california and nevada preserving historical cultural sites and knowledge she is working on her formal education in archaeology so that she may assist indigenous people with repatriating re, re, repatriar reclamar their historic cultural items, documents, photos, and recordings. In doing this work, she wants to return she wants to return those relatives home, thus freeing them from settler colonial cages, also known as museums or archaeological archives. That's um that's some pretty heavy stuff. And this uh, Emma is is uh, young. Uh, she's 19 years old. And I applaud where where she's at in 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 your aspirations. I mean, I think it's just wonderful, and it's so good that you got that knowledge and that desire while you're so young. So you have many years ahead of you to accomplish that. And so I'm really anxious to hear what you have to share with us this evening, Emma. Sorry, I was still muted. Um, oh, I thought you were missing me. <laughs> no, um, not really sure where to start. I think I just want to say thank you for letting me be um, on this panel. And it's really inspiring to hear from all of you, um, especially at my age. Uh, I'm very thankful that uh, for to let me be on this Sorry, my sister's being very loud. Um, let me be on this panel because I feel like people my age um, are usually told that we need to just sit down and listen and do what we're told and um, you know, not think for ourselves, just, um, just take everything in and don't speak up. And I'm really happy that um, I was allowed to be on this so that I could do that so I could speak from um, speak for people my age and uh, that's kind of a lot of the work that I do is with people my age and helping them through school and finding themselves um, because I feel like in a world in the world that we're in right now it's um, so overly complicated and we've lost touch with those things and um, I really related to Isaac's story about how when he was a boy and he was healed um, by going to those people, by having that help from those medicine people and hearing those stories about um, 
the spirits that live around him because um, those are the things that I um, love learning about, love coming back in touch with those roots because I feel like we've lost that. Um, a lot of tribes have lost that. And sorry. <laughs> um, I think it's so important to be able to be in touch with those things and step outside of the world that we're living in right now and go back and see that um, we are part of something much greater um, that we don't see, that it's it's stepping outside of the modern world that we live in now, that it's like, yes, you work every day, and yes, you have to do all these things to be able to survive, but we forget where our roots are from and we forget um, who we used to be and how strong our people are and that um, we shouldn't be brought down for that. And um, that's why it's so important for me. Um, it's been very hard to tell people that I want to go into archaeology because they assume that um, I'm doing it to be able to get into those cultural sites and be digging and handling those artifacts and all of those things and that's not at all why. Um, I think it's just getting another person into that window to be able to say like, no, we shouldn't take those things away. We shouldn't have to go into the ground and move these um, artifacts, move these living things from where they're from. And um, I've learned from the work that I've done so far that there are huge archives, museums full of history, full of documents and artifacts that some of the tribes don't even know exist anymore. And they've lost those things. So I want to help bring them back um, so that we can get back into touch with that because it wasn't that long ago um, that we were completely banned from doing those things. From um, being part of our culture and practicing um, our ceremonies. And so I think it's so great to be able to get, um, be in touch with that again and help those tribes find those things and share them with them and be able to help them have a voice, being able to speak up for themselves um, and knowing those laws, knowing those rights that they're not allowed to take those things from them. And they have to share those things with them. Um, and that's mostly why I'm inspired to do what I do. And um, while doing that, it's also important to be taking care of myself, being able to um, be in the right mindset to be handling those things because they still hold um, very heavy, heavy feelings, heavy emotions that comes with seeing those things and being part of that. And um, that's where I'm so grateful to be raised the way I was because then I got to learn about these um, and learn about gathering and what can help me to be able to stay in that mindset um, and practicing it by gathering is how I learned to be able to do that and working with the elders um, I had already experienced gathering with them and learning about the plants and listening to the stories and I think that helps me a lot um, to be able to do that, but it's, it's hard, like I said, stepping outside of the world that we're in now um, and just being able to stop and see. Um, so important to be able to go be back in touch with those things, um, like gathering, like using our medicines and um, learning about our culture more um, and the tribes that you come from or just the tribes where you live. Um, so I think that's all I have to say for right now. Uh, that was wonderful. Yeah, thank you. You know, I find myself uh, love being around younger people. And sometimes when they say, how come you like hanging around younger people? I said, well, because I'm an energy vampire. <laughs> and when I'm around all these young people, it gives me, it gives me so much energy. And I, you know, and I feel like I'm, I'm uh, a lot younger. You know, and I think I am in spirit, really. But um, I wanted to say that people your age uh, have so much to teach me. I feel like your words educate me. And, I, and it gives me uh, uh, courage knowing that young people like you are really protecting uh, our history for us in a good way. 
So thank you, Emma. I enjoyed that very much. Uh, is it time for questions and answers now, Desiree? Well, so anyone who would like to ask questions, you can unmute yourself. Um, I think, you know, it's just so much to take in. We've been given such a gift in this panel. You know, a lot of just um, things to absorb and think about and to reflect in how it applies to our life. I mean, I'm just so grateful that everyone has, has spoken. And um, I don't know, Brooke, do you have any questions or should we leave it open for a little bit of popcorn style Q and A? Um, I just had uh, some people that are shy and things like that, but there have been several kind of themed questions that have either popped up either in my inbox for the shy ones or for, like, or just in generally into the Facebook group or, or the chat. So um, just a question at uh, all three of our panelists and, and also our grandmother and the group is uh, people who are non-Indigenous that are settlers, when it comes to following protocol and land acknowledgement and kind of reaching out to medicine people or to tribes to say, hey, you know, I have this property that was obtained. This is, I know, was a part of your historic ancestral uh, territories. Like, I guess they were kind of curious on how they should go about approaching that. And also, do they need permissions? Because they, knew, they were knew, knew that they need permissions for like sacred medicines and things like that, but they were thinking more about invasive species. So they just go ahead and harvest the heck out of it. Or, you know, so th those are the kind of like the two questions regarding um, kind of like being a non-Indian in a Indian space or on stolen territory. Any three or four of you who want to kind of talk about that topic or any protocols around that you think that they should be following or, um, yeah. Kristenia, I think that you might be muted. Okay, I just unmuted myself. I was listening to what you said, but for some reason, and I'll blame my age. I was thinking you were making a really nice uh, statement. You know, um, I didn't realize it was a question. So could you repeat the question for me, please? So basically I had some people come to me, um, non-Indians and settlers, uh, who own property or who own pieces of stolen land. And so mm -hmm. they were kind of curious on how as non-Indians and settlers, they can go about proper protocols to either build relationships with tribes for harvesting and foraging. And also if they need permission for all plants or is it just the sacred plants? So the question that they have for me is like things like uh, garlic mustard, can they just harvest that like crazy without asking traditional medicine people and also bridging better relationships between non-Indians and natives uh, with regards to kind of like whose land is it? You know, they have these deeds, they're stolen, but yet it's still traditional lands of the people that, you know, were from there. So that's kind of like, they were kind of curious on how did they mitigate that space? Ah, well, I, I would say first off, that these sound like people who are really trying to um, do the right thing. And I'm surprised that they would even think to go to uh, the, the, the leaders of the territory that they're in to ask about that, you know, to ask what is the proper way for them to harvest the medicines. And, and still, it sounds like they were also asking for um, guidance uh, from, from elders from, from that from that tribal territory. So um, I, think, I think that's wonderful. And so uh, I think that's forming some kind of a real bridge between that person or that family and, and the tribe. I think they're really sincere in their heart to do something like that. So I think it would be nice for uh, a representative, uh, you know, somebody who's been appointed as a representative by elders to go and to show them the proper protocol, you know, and, and along with the protocol, I wanted to share just one thing. Um, 
when I, you know, when I go to pick, especially uh, if I'm picking um, red willow, you know, uh, after after I I take what I need, I always make sure to doctor the plant. My offering is generally tobacco, and then um, I sage I sage down the plant, and then after um, I take down what I need, I use I use a bit of the water, sacred water. And I mix it in with the ashes from the from the sage, and I make it into a paste, and then I doctor the area that that I took um, branches from, you know, and I give thanks, you know. But I, so I just wanted to say that. But I think that I think those are the kinds of things that people maybe would like to learn. Uh, Isaac, what do you think? I think that uh, what you said was really good. You know, I think that human beings are so interconnected that sometimes it's even hard to co comprehend how connected we really truly are. Yeah. You know, so for example, um, when I drink water, you know, I pee it out and it goes into the, into the water. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. And then, and then Desiree will drink it. And, you know, Desiree, um, you know, we'll pee it out and, you know, it, it becomes a family of squirrels. And then the mm -hmm. family of squirrels become a thundercloud and then become that invasive species and then becomes that, that indigenous species and then becomes a, a brand new baby. And so everything is just filled with water and we're so connected to everything. And so I think that for those that have the traditional knowledge um, about, you know, that particular plant, that it's important to share that with, with them and to, to help them along because it's, it's going to help them because sometimes plants can also be um, dangerous um, when, when not uh, used right. And so there's some plants that just need that extra attention. I know for, uh, for many of my people back home, you know, we're Shkabewis to a, to a, an elder or medicine person where we learn the intricate um, details of medicinal remedies and plants. And so that's really important for our learning and our education. And because there's so many uh, settlers and non-native people <laughs> that, that want access to these medicines, they're actually saying, you know what? Um, these, these native people got it right. And we need to start <laughs> learning from them. And so I, I believe that, that helping them along is okay. You know, we're all a big human family. And so let's, uh, yeah. let's, help, let's help everybody. You know, we're all, we're all in this together. We're all connected. Right, right Desiree? <laughs> so that's, that's, I think the same thing that you do, Brad. When you were talking about pee, though, I was thinking about what, uh, when I was learning about like the water cycle or something, you know, and, and how you were talking about how the pee goes into the water, uh, down to the groundwater and et cetera, et cetera. And the way this, this one guy looked at me and he said, you know, we're still drinking dinosaur pee. <laughs> 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 and if you think about it, <laughs> I said, oh, okay. That's what your story made me think of, Isaac. Can I, I'm sorry, I, I jumped into this late and I missed a lot. I had other things, but can I address the land oh, acknowledgement? Yes. Hi. Um, Hi, baby girl. I have been called on so many times because I, like, I am uh, <laughs> one of the few Indigenous people that, even though Occupied Virginia is full of Indigenous people, people call on me all the time for doing land acknowledgements and want me to come to these things and do these things. And what I finally started telling um, the settlers is you don't need an indigenous person to do this. It is good that you do it yourself. You need to acknowledge that you're standing on stolen lands. And this is the tribe that this territory uh, belonged to. This was where they existed. So I tell them, you don't need us to come and do that. You need to do that. And that helps us. That helps us know that you recognize where you're at and that you're on stolen land. So I encourage them to do that on their own. 
a land blessing, <laughs> different thing, but that acknowledgement, they need to be doing that. The more that they do, the more that they will get it in their minds that they are on stolen lands. That's all. I would agree. Okay. I would agree with you, hon, but, but what I think is that maybe what they're really asking is they want to know a way to uh, uh, have that plan and understand how they appreciate it. And I think once we, you know, once we show them how we do it, and this is share, just sharing with our other indigenous relatives, because we're not all red, you know, we're black, we're brown, you know, we're white, Irish, Scottish, those are, you know, very indigenous people who suffered a lot of the same things that all indigenous people have suffered. I think they just want maybe just a sample or an example um, of how we do it. And then, and then we can tell them, you don't have to call on us anymore because now you see, and now you can put, put, your, put it in your own words uh, yourself. And so you don't need us anymore because now you know. That's how I felt. I 100% agree with that. All right, thank you. You look so pretty, Vanessa. Thank you, I like you, so you. I love you. I love you too, honey. See, we're just, all in love on here. I like it. Just a little bit on um, land acknowledgement. I'm kind of radical, but for me, like, it just has to be more than a statement. When you're acknowledging that someone is the traditional governance of a territory, you're directly saying, I no longer support US occupation. That's a big statement. And so I think aside from, you know, it's really important to teach them how to do that so that they can be respectful to the tribes territories they're in, but it can't just be a point where it's just becomes a token statement that they make. And they really have to be building those relations they have to, you know, that's why I'm, I'm kind of happy that, you know, we have people in this group asking us, well, how do we get in contact with the tribes? How do we bridge those relationships? How do we give back the governance of these lands? And so for me, like, I've seen a lot in activist spaces, many, many times people will use land acknowledgements to have like a, a token Indian and to have novelty in their action, but they need to, organizers need to start asking, why am I putting this land acknowledgement in there? It's, is it to show that I have, oh, this said ethnic group, this minority? Because a lot of times people don't understand that indigenous people are sovereign nations. And they think of us as just minorities and labels and as just insert, insert here, insert there. So what winds up happening is that they, they tokenize native into like a little thing in their agenda and then we wind up losing the importance and what land acknowledgement is about. And that it is about acknowledging that the true governing systems are the people that were there prior to contact and that most of the cases are still there. Some tribes unfortunately have been, you know, mass murdered. So there is no tribe there anymore. But even ancestrally to say, no, we, we acknowledge that there was a great wrong done here and it ends today. And that's for me is like the more radical approach to land acknowledgement that it's not just, oh, I acknowledge that, you know, you're the traditional people here, but that you are the government here. You are the deciding people here. Your, your culture literally has been here for millennia and is the only culture that knows the relationship and knows it, these lands, knows the spirits, knows the old ways, knows what the future is gonna be for these lands. Um, but that's just my perspective on land acknowledgement. I, if I may add something, I think that's really, really cool. Uh, thanks for sharing that. Um, you know, I remember years ago, I talked uh, with uh, my grandparents and of course our, our land acknowledgements uh, we're always to the spirits of the land all the time and we never had like land acknowledgements how we have them today like how we see them today 
and that we used to make offerings. Uh, you know, Zen Baba Tigwo and Suck, we used to make all these sticks and offerings to these spirits all over the land. And that it was a, a responsibility based um, offering uh, to the land. And so for me, a land acknowledgement is really, it's not a rights based um, acknowledgement. It's, it's more about a responsibility based, uh, you know, acknowledgement on what we're going to do as human beings to be good and follow the natural laws that are here. And I remember years ago, uh, you know, when, when, uh, you know, I, I talked about our relationships with other tribes and how did we interact with other tribes when we'd go to different uh, territories. And it was beautiful what they did. Mm -hmm. You know, they adorned themselves with wampum and they would, they would make these beautiful speeches about each other yeah. and they would really um, highlight the good characters of each other. And so for me, land acknowledgement and people acknowledgement are two different things. And so, but that's in my own mind. And through the, when you understand it through the language, for me, it, it makes sense. And the, the people acknowledgements, you know, is really, really beautiful the way that they, the way they explained them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we lift each other up and we support each other. And, you know, nothing is really by, by a mistake. You know, everybody's here for a reason. There's a, there's a bigger thing going on here. We're all here. And, you know, some people will talk about, uh, I know invasive species are an important uh, conversation, you know, and, and, um, and, and settlers and, and all of these things. And, and, you know, when I, if I was a bird looking down on everything, I would think, you know what, if people would work together and, you know, find out each other's gifts and, and lift each other up, you know, they would, they would make it, they would make a beautiful, a beautiful place for each other. And to me, that's what acknowledging is all about. It's about lifting each other up and making people feel good and making people feel welcome. And that's what we do to the land. You know, that's what the land does for us. So that's what we do for, for the people. But I just wanted to share that. So thank you very much. Uh, and uh, I, I would, uh, okay, I would just uh, I'd like to add that um, um, I, I, I can be a pretty radical grandma, um, and uh, but I was thinking about what you said, and it's, um, you know, I think it's not just that we're invited by, maybe not necessarily, uh, 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 washichu, you know but by somebody who really cares and just happens to be within that system. And I think th the main thing I wanted to say here is it's taken 500 years for, for this to start making its, its way back around, you know? And so, and, and I'm seeing a time when now they're starting to come to us, you know, now they're starting to come to us, but it's taken this long, you know? And, uh, and I'm really grateful for that because it helps me heal a little bit more from all the times um, I was called dirty Indian. I was told I stink and, you know, all that crap when I was a little girl and, you know, all of the crap that I went through and my ancestors went through. And, and so I see that change. And, and I liked what, um, what Isaac said when he said, Isaac, you may have to help me. Uh, when you said um, uh, something about if you don't like something uh, or you think it's bad, you know, don't don't uh, put don't feel anger at it, feel good at it. Is that how you said it, Isaac? Because um, nothing if you if you counter bad with bad, it's not going to change it. But if you counter it with good, you know, then it starts to it starts to change. It starts to evolve into something else. And so, honey, it did take us a long time to get in, in, in the space where we are now. And right now it's really heavy because we're seeing so much violence and against people of color. But I don't know, I feel it. 
I feel it right here, and I feel it right here that a change is going to come, maybe sooner than we know. You know, uh, when you're when you're talking, um, you know, it it brought back memories of my childhood, of when we were systematically removed from our lands by yeah. by the Indian agents. Yeah. And I was only five years old when I was taken away and my, my three brothers and uh, my mother, uh, sorry, I'm going to get a little emotional and a little bit, uh, but I need, I need to say this because this is important. You know, our lands were, were once beautiful and they were devastated by uranium mining mm -hmm. and they came in and they built 11 uranium mines and they wow. cleared all of us out of the forest and they contained us on the reserves where we were systematically removed by Indian agents and forced into colonization. We were not allowed to live with our parents mm -hmm. um, because we were known as the Indian problem because we had our own government, we had our own laws, we had our own sustainable economy. And so we were, of course, the problem because they wanted to have full resource extraction in our territories. And so we were removed from our families. And I remember that the day that it happened, it was in July and it was the day after my birthday. And I remember the Indian agents came to the door. Um, everybody was crying. Uh, we're all hanging mm -hmm. on to my mom. My dad was gone somewhere. I didn't know where he was. And my mother was just wouldn't, wouldn't open the door. And the RCMP uh, kicked the door in and uh, they came in. And they just they just picked us up and they started throwing us in a van. And uh, my youngest brother Francis, he uh, he was the smallest one. He was only three years old, and he tried to get away. And uh, he nobody knew where he was, and the van took took off because it was so chaotic, and they didn't know that he was hiding underneath a van. And uh, they, they they ran him over. And he, they ran him over his stomach. And he survived, but he's been uh, on disability ever since. And the resident, the, the impacts of residential school and, uh, you know, have been really hard on my family. You know, my daughter is only six years old, seven years old now. And, you know, she's the first child that hasn't been taken away by Indian agents in 120 years in my bloodline and so there's been a lot of of trauma and a lot of um hardship uh brought to my people and to my to my family and it's been difficult to um you know to be the kind person that we need to be you know i grew up in a very um hard harsh reality as a child and you know it's it, it's taken me years to try to get back to a place where you know I feel good about myself and I feel like like I can give back. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, like I said, I don't want to get emotional because it's it, but it is, and it's hard to 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 deal with with everybody in our territories. It's hard to deal with um, all of this the, the people that come. And they keep destroying our lands. And they, they just keep coming and we don't know how to stop them. And, you know, I believe in love and that we have to keep giving love. And that, that hopefully it'll help. Because I, I can't be an angry Indian anymore. I can't live my life like that because I have a daughter. And she needs to see a, a role model. And she yeah. needs to see somebody that's, that's giving love instead of, of hate. And so I believe that whatever we do, if we if it comes from a place of love, then it can change things. Because if the, if the problem is hate and greed, then the antidote is love and giving and, and sharing and, and believing in each other. Yeah. You know, for Indigenous people, for many of us, it's this is a hard thing. You know, we have to dig deep to do this, you know, yeah. and I'm so, I'm so proud of my people. And I'm so proud of our grandmothers like you that keep us, that remind us, you know, that love is the way to go. So thank you for that reminder. And uh, sorry for, for crying on here. Holy. Um, 
but uh, but thank you. <laughs> Hello, Maria. How's it going, Maria? That was good. Good of you to say. You know, um, I think I was going to share with you that um, I'm the first in your talk that I was watching uh, last week, I guess it was, um, you talked about you have 150 years of, you know, your family, your ancestors, your elders uh, being sent off to boarding school. I'm the first, I'm the first one in, in a long line. I mean, I have that, that same story, you know, about about probably four generations back or whenever they started the boarding school system. Um, my my uh, ancestors have been shipped off to boarding schools too. And, you know, and, and I feel like, you know, um, how I am, who I am, whatever I am and wherever I'm going, you know, um, or who I was was a product of, you know, uh, the boarding school mindset uh, of my parents and stuff uh, and where I'm going is 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 on a journey to to wellness and wholeness and trying to shed all of that pain and that sadness and I understand your tears honey because I've shed a lot of them myself for my mother my grandmother my great-grandmother you know you named the boarding school and one of my ancestors have been to that boarding school so it's a long incredibly cruel history um and and it and it's this healing that we're all talking about it's this healing of the earth and and because we are the earth she's healing us you know and and it, i can feel the healing coming up through my feet to the very soles of my feet uh, especially when i'm walking barefoot which i don't do too much anymore so it has to come through the soles of my shoes oh. <laughs> and uh, and i can feel it travel up through my body and it lands right in my heart, you know. Um, and I just, I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful for forums like this. I'm grateful for all of the indigenous connections I make. I'm grateful to the, all of the indigenous people around the world. Do you know there's not one, um, all the nations, black, red, yellow, white nations, all have had that same history. You know, and sadly enough, so many of them don't even know that they've had that history. And so they're never going to be able to, uh, I don't think that they can start a real strong healing uh, uh, until, they, until they understand that th th this history was also a history for a lot of them, except for the, um, what did you call them? The... Uh, uh, alien species that came from some really ugly i don't even know if it could be called a star system but you know who i'm talking about <laughs> all the, the people that came here from some star system because we all see that's the thing indigenous people we all know we're from a star system someplace else you know we know our true origins but then the ones who came here from wherever they came from they come from someplace that was really cruel you know because they came and they started killing, destroying, plundering, um, and have no respect for the earth or anything. They, they just saw it as a whole big dead, I don't know, orbiting, orbiting around, you know, the sun or something because they just, and, and still those ones are still among us, but hopefully, you know, they're going to say, well, we've done as much damage as, as we can and, and take off. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to start talking like that. I get crazy sometimes. Okay, that's all I have to say. Um, if at this time uh, we actually lost Linda and Emma had to go, um, so we just wanna thank Linda and Emma for being here, but we still do have uh, Christina and Isaac. So if anybody wants to ask any questions before we wrap up and give the giveaways or announce the giveaways rather. I, I, I wanted to share something. Uh, good evening to everyone. Uh, my name is Renee Sansusi. I'm a member of the Omaha tribe of Nebraska. And what I wanted to say, I wanted to address it to the young woman that was on the panel. And I don't remember her name. Uh, 
but I know that you're recording this, right? So she can probably check back, but just what I wanted to say in about uh, our young people, especially the young people now, uh, what, what we're witnessing and what we're experiencing right now is a return to our ways, uh, more so than before. And what we're also experiencing are those teachings that were once lost, I would say, like for my tribe, about uh, approximately 200 years. And we're just now beginning to get back a lot of our traditions. And this has happened through by people going out to fast and helping to uh, bring back, you know, that healing, but also to bring back our history and what we once practiced. And for the young people, what I think is important for all of us to understand is that what we had in place at one time were those ceremonies to guide us, especially when our children were being born. Because it was during that time when uh, even before they were born that we were being told to prepare for them. And that way they were, you know, they were saying, oh, we got so-and-so or you're gonna have this person coming to your family. And this is the kind of person that they are and this is what you need to prepare for. And when they come, then this is how you have to raise them. And when that happened, then we as families had a way of preparing ourselves and then also, also being, <laughs> that I guess you'd say the best parents that we could be to honor that specific child that was being born or brought into our families. And we lost that connection for a very long time. That was a, a common practice, I would say, back in the day, you know, before colonization. I always say BC, before colonization. Uh, but this is what happened with me. You know, when I was uh, about uh, 25, 26, well, longer, I guess 30 years ago now, uh, I was told in a ceremony that uh, a young little girl, a baby girl was coming to my family. And I didn't understand what that meant in the ceremony. I just assumed they were talking about my parents. And when they said, you know, this special person is coming and you have to prepare yourself, I didn't understand. I thought, oh, they're talking about my mom and dad because, well, I'm not married. You know, I don't even have a boyfriend. How am I, you know, so it's not me they're talking to. But it was me they were talking to. And six years later, of course, you know, I was married like two years later after this ceremony. And then uh, six years after that ceremony, my first daughter was born. And we had her naming ceremony. And for me, I was just like, that was well, we're gonna have her naming ceremony, right? We did that and then we were told everything about her. And they told me, they said, this is the baby girl we told you about. And I was like, oh my God, you know, I, that never occurred to me that they were telling me about the future. And then they gave me all these instructions, like a whole long list of how I was supposed to teach her and how I was supposed to raise her. And believe me, at that time, I was so overwhelmed because I felt like I don't even know half of what they told me what to do. I don't know. I was so overwhelmed after the ceremony, I was sitting there crying. And her dad said, what's the matter? And I said, how am I going to teach her all those things that they just told me that I'm supposed to do? And he said, you know, he said, it's okay. You have time. They didn't say it had to be like immediately. You have time. So what it did for me was it shaped my life because I had to commit to teaching my daughter the things that I was instructed to teach her and to bring her up that way that they had, you know, instructed me to do. That meant okay, if I need to have this knowledge, then I have to go out and fast for it because I don't have any teachers around here to help me. That's what I committed to. And then 
to be able to bring her up that way and to bring up all my children that way. That was something that was not easy in regards to how this mainstream society expects us to interact in this world. You know, we're supposed to be professionals. We're supposed to work eight to five where our kids are supposed to be in school on and on. And I didn't want to send my kids to school. And for a number of years, I did homeschool them to instruct them about what they needed to learn about, you know, what the spirits had told me how to raise my oldest, but in turn, how to raise all my children. When we were intact, and I'm talking about my own tribe uh, 200 and some years ago, we had the means for all of these teachings and we had everything that we needed, everything. You know, we had the land, we had our medicines, we had all the food, we were wealthy and healthy people. And then suddenly all these things happened, you know, one after another. And suddenly we're impoverished. We had no land. We had no means to support ourselves. And then they take our kids away and on and on, you know, the story, you know. But now we're in this place where we're healing and we want our, we want our kids to know their identities and to have these teachings. And it's hard at times because, you know, like my children and I, we live in the city. So we're doing everything we can to, to remain in touch with our traditional values. And I want to, you know, make that known to this young woman that was speaking before, like why, you know, how she felt uncomfortable about speaking because, you know, we're taught that our young people aren't supposed to speak out. However, because, you know, someone like my daughter was born, she was brought into this world with knowledge already. And to me, it's always like, I always feel like I'm dealing with an elder, somebody older than myself. I've never had to instruct her a whole lot because she already had that ingrained knowledge. I guess you'd say that DNA knowledge to tap into. And she's utilized it in so many different ways that she's like self-taught on everything you could think of. I've literally, all I've ever had to do was give her the materials and supply all the things that she needed in order to, you know, create, you know, this thing or that thing and to, to do things like that. Our young people that are being born are like that now. That's what I wanted to remind this young woman of, that if this is her, her, what her path is like, and she has this knowledge already, then she should not feel guilty or feel that way that she, you know, I guess she's already carrying that knowledge. So, you know, anything that she can draw upon from anybody, any of the elders and so forth, then she, you know, is blessed, even more blessed. So I'm grateful for, you know, that, you know, this panel on, on the forum is occurring at, you know, at least in that sense that uh, I know that with uh, all the people that are here, they have an understanding about what I'm talking about. And, uh, that these things do happen, you know, and we do know where we came from, you know, that we came from the stars. We know the system we came from. We know how we got here. We know what we're supposed to be doing. And even though we've had a disruption of like 200, 500 years, whatever that is, that we are regaining that and very rapidly because we have to now. So that much I can say. And I wanted to thank everybody. We uh, that means I thank you. It, uh, it's a very similar word to Wopila. So, because our language is very similar to Lakota and Dakota. So, Ewe they Wongi they, all my relations. Thank you. So, are there, does anybody? else have any questions or comments god this is a great conversation i just love it isaac are you hiding oh 
I'm here. <laughs> okay, good to know. <laughs> Wasn't that wanted, beautiful? I really wanted to say to, to Renee that, uh, you know, what a beautiful, powerful statement. Um, I've known Renee since, uh, since we were kids. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> and so it's, it's always, it's always good to hear, hear my good friend and, uh, you know, just what she's saying is, you know, talking about spirit and hope and, you know, believe, you know, believing it's just mm -hmm. such a strong message. So thank you so much, Renee, for that beautiful message. Right. And hopefully that young lady, that young lady gets it, you know, um, you're, you're such a special person. And I just think the world of you, and I just, just want you to know that. Miigwech. Miigwech. If there are any last questions or commentaries, because um, then we'll probably be wrapping up shortly. So last minute questions, commentaries, opinions, thoughts. I think what we have coming up next is a giveaway. I'm allowed to talk. Yeah. Oh, I think somebody asked something? Yeah, I had a question. I'll okay. try to get in the late. Well, there's been, I put it in the comments, but there's been so many um, mentions about the stars and being connected to the stars. And um, I am wondering, as you guys were saying here, I put myself in light. Um, I'm just wondering what is some comments about um, about how to be connected to the stars, especially for you know native stars like myself who would like to um, be more in tune. And right now I'm trying to work with like the moon cycles and um but also when i love these stories especially what isaac was saying about the constellations have all the information about the plants and the food in our own bodies and i'm uh, but I, I just want to hear a little bit more because so many people have mentioned the stars so many people and i just wanted to know if there's any more comments about star knowledge hmm. to be shared i don't know Oh, I can say something real quick. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Uh, I could say that that would be like a whole different discussion in itself, you know, and I'm sure Isaac has talked about that many times before. So that might be something that you can bring up again. Okay. Also, Heather, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> you may have heard me mention that all nations, all peoples were indigenous at one time. And we all had knowledge of, of, of a covenant that, uh, that each nation made with the creator of all that is. And, um, and, uh, and so then, and we've all gone through the same trials and tribulations, you know, some much earlier than others. And, but I think that, um, I don't know if you're of Irish or Scottish descent or what it is, but you know, you you should uh, start researching your indigenous roots. I think that we all have cellular memories and uh, different things like that that uh, that can help us lead guide guide us individually back to the beginning times, and then that's when you connect with your ancestors. That's when your awakening and your opening will begin, and you will find out what star system you're from. Yeah, I believe that. So take heart, Heather. Oh, is it time for the giveaway? Oh. <laughs> Brooke, I think it's time for the giveaway. Oh, yay! Giveaway time. Yay! Right. I know. Good breath. What is it? Okay, so let me just get up my little notes here. 
Okay, so we have three books that we're going to give to three winners. Um, if you could put up the picture, we're going to be giving away Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Camara. Are you able to put up the picture? Yep, I'm pulling it up right now. All right, cool. Oops. So this is an educational series. So we just want to be able to kind of uh, give back to the viewers and to the participants because this is a community and we just want to share things with you. And, you know, so we're going to be having every month at panels giveaways. So this week, I mean, this month rather, it's this book by Robin Wall Kamara. So the first winner of this book. <laughs> She's right not even Renee, Renee Sansucci. Woo! Yay, Renee. <laughs> Yay, thank you so much. <laughs> so the thank second you. winner of this book is <laughs> Sarah MacArthur, who I believe she's not on the chat this uh, time around, but we'll be sure to contact her and get her information and make sure she knows. But round of applause for, for MacArthur. She won a book. Woo! Woo -hoo 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 -hoo. <laughs> All right, so our last and final, but not least winner. is Merge Upwom. I don't believe she's on here neither, but we, we basically do a lottery of people that have been on and stuff like that. But big round of applause. Yay! Yay. Yay. <laughs> so if you are a winner and you're watching this or you missed this, we will be contacting you for your address to send the books and we hope you enjoy it. Maybe you can give us a book review. Wink, wink. Or you don't have to. We don't have to have that type of homework on here. But if you want to, you can give us a book review and tell us how you liked it. All right. So finally, um, just want to say thank you to all of our panelists and just everybody who's participated on this panel. Basically, the way First Foods is laid out is that every fourth um, First Foods program is a panel. And it features Kristenia our host with the most, um, and instructors that have been teaching First Foods, doing either cooking demos or show and tells or storytelling. And so you can look forward to uh, different panels like this for June and July. I'm gonna go ahead and put up the graphic for next time which it features Shannon Francis, which is about soil tasting and soil health. Mm. So soil tasting, you can tell a lot about what's going on with the soil by how it tastes. And Shannon Francis has for a very long time um, been leading the Denver Indian Center and this beautiful garden that they have in the back, uh, growing indigenous foods, teaching, native young people how to garden and plant and regain um, that connection that's sometimes lost with a lot of us urban natives, which is how I actually got to meet her. Um, yeah, we struck up a conversation about uh, seeds that I had come across and uh, she got me to get my hands dirty in 2.5 seconds. So she's a really fascinating lady who loves her people, who loves the community, loves the land. She's a wonderful person. Um, and so she will be our instructor for next week. The registration link is here at the bottom. And just a reminder, like from last week, we changed our registration process. So if you go to bit.ly slash first foods June, July, it will register you for all of the classes. And then that way you don't have to do one, two, three, which one, oh, I missed it and I can't find the link. It's always the same link and it will import really easily into your Google Calendar 
or your iCalendar, whatever it is that you use. So we've been thinking about how to make this, um, the set of free classes um, available a little more easily. So that is for next week. We have some amazing programming for you coming up uh, for the next two months. Uh, I could go on and on, but we'll post the information in the group. So if people want to know what's coming up next, but be sure to register at that bit.ly link so that it is always in your calendar. I did it. It's extremely convenient. I hope you enjoy it. Just thank you for coming and thank you to our, our speakers and Unchi Christinia for hosting. And as always, this is super fulfilling. So thank you. Thank you, everybody. Have a good night. Bye, Good night. Bye, everyone. Bye. Peace.